Welcome to our Zoom attendees. As you're coming into today's webinar, we are here today for Quiet is the New Superpower, Voices from the Introvert Revolution. And I am hosting today Jill Chang and Jennifer Conweiler. So today and this week happens to be the week that Jennifer and Jill are celebrating the launch of Jill's most recent book. And I think Jennifer has a copy of it, if you can hold it up. And what we want to do is, is highlight today the very important topic of introversion and introversion in the workplace. So as you're coming in, we want to tell you a few things to orient you to today's meeting. The first is that we will be using the chat throughout today's event, and we would love to hear from you. So I would invite you to take a moment right now and find the Zoom chat. Please use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees so that everyone on today's event can see your comments and engage with you. And what I'd love to invite you to do is take a moment to tell us where you're calling in from. Uh, Jill happens to be calling in from Taiwan. What time is it in Taiwan? It's 10 p.m. Oh my goodness. So it's 10 p.m. in Taiwan. It is 10 a.m. in Atlanta where Miss Jennifer is calling in from. So welcome to all of you. It looks like we have an international audience of people who are ready to learn and grow with us today. So welcome to all of you. If you have a moment to tell us if you're calling in from your organization, even if you're working remotely, we would love to know the name of the company that's supporting your participation in today's event. So please take a moment to tell us that as well and you know these comments are coming in so fast today I'm not sure I'm going to be able to shout you all out but I'm seeing uh, a bunch of universities I'm seeing a lot of corporations um, and we do also want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's event Barrett Kohler Publishers for making this special learning time possible for us so I'm going to pause for just a minute and say hi hi Jennifer hi Jill hey Miss Becky how are you <laughs> good hi, we're we're going to get started very 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 soon. Um, in the event that you would like to live tweet today's event or share it on other social media channels, we would welcome you to use the hashtag for today's event, Introvert Revolution. And we look forward to seeing your questions and comments uh, on, on Twitter later um, or on your preferred social media channels. It is so amazing to see such a great group of you. And we're going to dive in in a few moments. And as we do, what we'd love to know is what you think about yourself as it relates to this idea of introversion. So I'm about to launch a poll and we would love to know from you, do you consider yourself an introvert, an extrovert or an ambivert? And please choose only one. Um, just a quick side note, I'd be curious if any of you know of the three of us on today's panel, which of us are introverts and which of us are extroverts. So if you pay close attention, you may figure it out. Or if you've uh, watched one of my webinars in the past, you might already know. Um, really interesting uh, makeup of today's attendees. And I'll show those results in just a moment. Uh, before I show the results, um, Jennifer and Jill, would you like to uh, maybe guess about uh, the makeup of our audience today? Ah, okay. Jill, why don't you go first? What do you think? I would say probably 70% of introverts. That's my guess. That's a really good guess. Uh, really quickly, um, I know that we're going to later define introversion and talk in great detail, but someone has asked in the chat if we could define ambiverts. Ah, Okay, well, I guess I can take that one. Um, ambiverts are relatively new term, Becky, that has come up, and it really is sort of like think about ambidextrous using using both sides of your temperament. So some people tend to identify with that term. I find that uh, most don't. So I was curious about what we came out for the ambivert uh, percentages. You're going to leave us in suspense here, Becky. No, I'm going to show you. Joe was oh, fairly wow. close. We have 59% mm. introverts on today's call. Only about 10% of us identify as extroverts, and about a third are identifying as ambiverts. And um, unfortunately, you can't change your answers now. Um, but hopefully this was helpful as we dive into today's session. So as we get started, I will let you know that we are recording today's event and we will make this recording available after the session so you can watch it again or share it with friends and colleagues. We don't really have any content oriented slides, but toward the end of the hour, we'll, we will be opening 
opening up for questions from all of you. So please feel free at any point to put your questions in the chat and we will get to as many of those questions as we can. Okay, so we want to dive in. We're going to have a great conversation, but quickly I want to give you some background about our two panelists today. Jill Chang is currently the account director for Family Philanthropy of Give to Asia, an international nonprofit organization. Her book, Quiet as a Superpower, was a number one bestseller in Taiwan and on the top 10 list for 20 weeks. And as a result, Jill is often referred to as Taiwan's Susan Kane. Her book has just launched yesterday in English here in the U.S., and we are so thrilled to be able to host this event to celebrate the launch of the book. Jill is a graduate of leadership programs at Harvard University and a university in Beijing, and I will not try to say the name because I know I will mess it up. Um, so if you want to share that with us, Jill, you can. And Jill happens to be an extreme introvert who has been working remotely long before the pandemic started. Jill, we so look forward to learning with you today. You, I'm also thrilled to introduce my friend, Jennifer Conweiler, uh, PhD. She's a best-selling author, a global speaker, and a pioneer in the introvert revolution of the past decade. Uh, as you can see behind her, she has four books, um, and they have all been translated into 18 languages amongst the books. Um, and Jennifer has been a professional learning and development and a keynote speaker, um, working for organizations like Merck, the Centers for Disease Control, and NASA. And she has spoken all around the world until recently. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer happens to be a self-proclaimed extrovert. And one of her favorite activities is laughing with her granddaughters. So let's, um, let's dive into our conversation today. And, you know, I love the story of how the two of you first met. <laughs> and there's, there's something there about Southern Fried Chicken. Um, so will right. you just share a little bit about the history of the relationship and collaboration between the two of you? Well, hi, everybody. It's so cool <laughs> to see everyone around the world, including my dear friend, Jill Chang and Becky. You know, it actually, Becky went ahead of fried chicken. I got an email late one night and I was ready to put my computer away and I opened up the email and it was from a woman named Jill Chang, who we see here today. And Jill reached out to me. She said that she was an introvert and had been transformed by learning about introversion. In fact, so transformed that she actually wrote an entire book about her experience and her stories of becoming a successful career person in her country. And I was just taken by her writing, by her humor, by her candor, and most of all, by her humility. And I, without, I knew the book was not translated, she mentioned in, into English, but I just knew that I had to endorse it. She, that started our journey. And luckily, Jill got here to Atlanta one day and we had a lovely lunch over Southern Fried Chicken. And turns out she was pretty global already. She knew all about grits. I couldn't teach her anything about that, but we just connected and have been become good friends. And uh, it's just been a thrill to uh, watch Jill and, other people around the world really take this message of introversion beyond the borders of the US and really um, take it and make a huge difference in the world. So that's sort of the, that's the story. And I don't know if Jill has another take on our, <laughs> on our meeting, but uh, that was how I experienced that joy and I still do. And up until yesterday when the book came out and I'm gonna put it up here again, so proud. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, like uh, like Jennifer said, uh, I reach out to her as a reader and as a influence of her work, of her amazing work. And I didn't realize that she would be so helpful and so uh, supporting along the way. Like she introduced me to BK, to our publisher, and she basically became my mentor along the way. And there is no way I can describe my appreciation for her. So I, I'm really glad and I'm really feeling lucky that I have her and I have all the team at BK uh, for this book. Thanks so much for sharing that. I love it. So uh, let's start with some definitions. I mentioned when we did the poll that we would take some time to define introversion. So can you each define introversion and what you've learned about it from your reading? Jill, you want to start with that question? No, you, you can you can start. Oh. <laughs> See, I told her she's very humble. 
<laughs> and I, you know, it keeps morphing through the years, but it is, as many people know out there, if you've ever taken an assessment or know something about introversion, it's about energy. And introverts get their energy, and please validate this or not, Jill, from within. They, go, they really crave and need and embrace solitude. And that is what gives them the strength to come up with incredible creative ideas to go deep. And then they can go out into the world again once they've taken those breaks. And that's really sort of how we look at introversion now or how I do. It's about the, the need, the overstimulation, which can really shut you down as an introvert or extroverts tend to be able to get out there and they like to be, and also there's now brain chemistry now, uh, studies that show that extroverts actually need more stimulation. But Jill, I'd love you to, to add to that from your own perspective. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I actually read a lot of books, pretty much every book I could get before writing my own, and I did research on introversion. Uh, there were definitely different definition about introversion, but I echo what Jennifer said. Um, it's all about energy, how we recharge ourselves. Um, so being a very quiet girl, I'm always the quietest uh, one uh, when I grew up and people always say, oh, you're so quiet, you must be an introvert. So that's how I relate introvert uh, in early days. I thought introversion means being quiet. But I, I learn more and get to know more introverts. I found there are loud introverts, talkative introverts, showy introverts. So it's not, it's a wide range of people, but the only thing in common is probably that uh, we need to recharge ourselves by being alone um, when having a long day or when um, getting things done um, after, after several uh, projects or, or et cetera. So, yeah, that's how I learned um, myself by writing the book and by reading and learning from the other introverts. Yeah, and I think there was a certain amount of judgment that you mentioned to me that you felt, and a lot of introverts do, and bias about when you were called quiet. It wasn't necessarily like, oh, that's great, Jill, that you're quiet. Uh, no. But, and then you started, I think the transformation that I observed that you shared in the book so beautifully, and the book has so many wonderful stories of how you had that realization that you did it in your own way. You, know, you negotiated big deals. You got the, the next level on your promotion, not by being you know, a, a, an aggressive, out there, flaming extrovert, but you did it in a very quietly powerful way. But I wonder, would you say that that was part of your transformation that you uh, yeah. actually stepped into the ownership of your quiet? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, it's part of like, it's a, it's a journey of knowing, really knowing who I am and really embracing my personalities. Because I grew up being the quietest one and I always wanted to be someone else. I wanted to be more outgoing, more aggressive, more talkative. I, I thought people would like me more if I were like that. But then I realized it's very draining and um, that's on top of all. Oh, and then I couldn't really get anything done because I was trying too hard to pretend to be someone else. So instead of saying like, yeah, I, instead of saying, um, I cannot do that because I'm, a, I'm because I'm an introvert, I started to remove all those texts from myself. I started to embrace um, a more growth mindset, so to say. Um, I started to think, okay, maybe I can do that too, but in my own way. So I started like ex making some experiment along the way and try to find things, find ways to get things done and more efficiently in my own personalities. So Jill, I mentioned at the beginning that your book was a bestseller in Taiwan and you became a celebrity. So can you share with mm -hmm. us a little bit about what that experience was like for you as an introvert, you know, and how you handled being in the public eye? Yeah, so that's definitely not something that I expected in the first place. Uh, I didn't expect that uh, people would show up and approach me in random places and ask for autographs. And I didn't expect there were um, online haters who didn't hesitate to share their criticism about my pretty much everything. Um, so being a very typical introvert who uh, 
always been trying to stay away from the spotlight and center of attention. It's not an easy part for me. It's, it's not an easy thing for me to do. Um, so Jennifer knows about this. For a, for a period of time, I was super overwhelmed and I, I didn't even have the nerve to check on social media uh, for a period of time. And then there was one day uh, I was reminded that um, one of my friends said, hey, Jill, maybe you pay too, more, too much attention on how other people think instead, instead of enjoying this ride. Why don't you just um, look around and see the love around you? So I started to read the positive feedback about myself. And um, I heard great things about a book, like uh, people say that my book changed their lives, changed their family, changed their relationship, changed their career. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been neglecting all these because I was paying too much attention on the criticisms. So yeah, it, it's still part of the journey that I transform. I became more um, embracing what I have instead of like trying to please everyone instead of trying to be someone else and try to make everyone ha happy. So. That is so powerful, Jill. So can we talk for a moment before we shift to a question about Jennifer and her latest book about who your intended audience is for this English edition of your book? Yeah, so from my previous experience, because this book is all about struggles, all about my personal struggles and about, all about my experience as an international um, uh, worker. So I think this book would be especially beneficial for a young professional who's trying to climb up the corporate ladder and uh, becoming a good leader and manager. And also people who have or who work with uh, people from different cultural backgrounds. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm sure and, there are many me, on this call who can benefit from that. <laughs> let me do the extrovert thing and, and jump in here for a sec. Um, I, I think people should know too that Jill um, also is very multinational, uh, that she spent um, several years in the US and now works with a global company where she's supervising and managing a team of how many now, Jill? I, I can't, I know it's a large team where you- 23. 23, but you've made many trips you know, around the world, including yeah. spending time uh, getting your, uh, your, your education, as Becky said here. So you, you know, I yeah. think for a lot of people, they have that question about the cultural differences. Um, and we've talked about that with Taiwan and, and with the US and Taiwan being a little more Western. Uh, but there's that whole overlay as well. But I think that really brings a lot of understanding to the book uh, for English audiences who, who will, will get that she gets it very much so. So thank Becky, you, Jennifer. Thank you yeah, so, so uh, Jennifer, I happen to have your book on my desk oh. and this is your fourth book on the topic of introversion. I'm wondering yeah. if you can talk about why this book, Creating Introvert Friendly Workplaces is needed now and what type of response you're getting. And I think we're gonna do another poll as you're answering this question. Yeah, let's, that would be great to do another poll. You know, I, the readers tell me, Becky, of my other books, what the next book is. I, I like to, to listen to what they say. And one of the things I was hearing from people who were finding value in the other books that were about more about how do you build on your quiet strengths as an introvert, not turn into an extrovert, or like in uh, The Genius of Opposites, I don't remember the name, uh, The Genius of Opposites, how introverts and extroverts can make it work. Those are all more on the individual um, and even team level. But what folks would tell me is that they would go back into their workplaces and their organizations and the system did not support them as introverts. And it was going uphill all the time, trying to be who they were, trying to be authentic. And so I started to look at workplaces and what we could discover about what the challenges are um, in trying to fit into a more of a type A extroverted workplace as an introvert. Um, and number two, what were some of the best practices that we were finding that we are discovering in companies? And it was a really cool journey because I was starting new research. There really wasn't anything on there. I think I remember Googling this when Steve Persani was asking me what was out there. He's the, um, the my editor at Barrett Kohler. And, uh, and I remember I Googled, there was an article, a blog post I had written about this. It wasn't much there. So it's like, oh, okay, I think that's a clue. 
So I actually designed a survey, did interviews, and got the chance to go visit um, at Silicon Valley and some very progressive companies that were doing some very cool things. So we came up with um, uh, some good research that I was then able to put into a practical design to help the real goal is to help workplaces become more introvert friendly uh, and har harness everyone's talent. And the idea is that everybody in an organization can be a change agent. So we looked at seven different practices, including workplace design, leadership, communication, and specific tactics you could take, specific questions you can ask. And we actually have a quiz that goes with that that we'll, um, we'll put on at the end of the, the program, or you guys can put it in the chat to you know assess how how much your company or your workplace or your team supports um, uh, introverts. And I think that's where the work and the opportunity is now. We need to shift the culture. We need to shift workplace culture. That's really helpful. So let's take a moment and check in with our attendees and find out what they're experiencing in the workplace. So we do have a poll. It says, I believe that introverts are valued in my workplace. You can strongly disagree, slightly disagree, neither agree nor disagree, slightly agree or strongly agree. And we would love to hear from you about what you're experiencing in your workplaces. So we'll give a few moments on this. Uh, what I'm noticing so far is that there is a wide range of responses all over the spectrum in terms of people feeling or uh, you know, experiencing being valued as an introvert in the workplace. Um, I do have a comment here from Casey and he said that one of the past presidents of a board that he sits on really got it and he would have introverts at the end of a, a day of a board meeting reflect and write reflections on paper. Um, so Elizabeth is mentioning on the Myers-Briggs that she's an INFJ. I asked earlier um, if you wanted to guess what we are on the panel. I, I am also an E, like Jennifer. Um, someone had commented that they think I act like an E, but that they think I'm an I. So just to answer that earlier comment, I'm going to show these poll results. About 75% of you have answered. And here's what we have. It looks like a third of the people on the call slightly agree that introverts are valued in their workplaces and only 15% strongly agree. So it looks like there is still work to be done. Almost a third of you strongly disagree and you feel that introverts are not valued in your workplace. Yeah, that, that is very consistent with what I'm seeing. Is that surprise you at all, Jill, seeing that those figures? Um, not really. <laughs> Right. Yeah. In your experience too, like in the study, I was just looking yeah. at our stats on that. And uh, it said that 34% stated out of a study of 200 introverts that their culture supported them. And that only less than 40% said that their organization demonstrates a willingness to promote and hire introverts. So yeah. this is where the tangible actions can be taken. You know, it doesn't necessarily take a lot to think, for instance, about your hiring process and is it introvert friendly? Um, and can you design a program where you don't exhaust people, let's say at the end of the day, you know, on their interview? Mm -hmm. So we have very practical suggestions and that's what I'm encouraging people to do. So it sounds like the audience is pretty uh, consistent with that. And we would love to hear in the chat if you guys have thoughts about um, what, you're, what you've seen as positive examples, like we just heard about that great example of a meeting. Certainly so. So, um... Jill, you um, have already shared a little bit of your experience as an introvert in a, in a more extroverted world. And so in the book, you also have a lot of personal and poignant stories about your experiences and also based on your time internationally. I'm wondering if you could share a favorite story from the book with our attendees today. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Becky. Uh, yes, I share a lot of uh, personal struggles and lessons learned in the book. Uh, let me just share one of my favorite um, struggles with you <laughs> and, and also lesson learned. <laughs> so there was one time I went to one of those international, huge international conferences with over a thousand participants coming from 40 something countries. Um, so my goal there was to sign 10 clients by the end of the four day conference. Um, they kicked off the conference by a cocktail party. I remember standing there at the gate holding my business cards and didn't know what to do because I didn't know any single person there. I didn't even know how to start a conversation with anyone. Um, but at the end of the day, I signed, instead of 10 clients, I signed 300 clients. But 
what happened, right? Like, did I do something at the cocktail party? No, I didn't do anything because I didn't have the nerve to stay. I actually went straight back to my hotel room. But what I did is that I did a research on all the participants' background information, and I shortlisted five top prospects. They were all key influencers that I thought they might be helpful for um, achieving my goals. I set up one-on-one -on -one coffee chats with them. And by the end, end of the day, one of them really liked what I said. So he brought all his members on board and there were 300 of them. Um, I, I share this because it's actually one of my favorite experiences because I, was, I used to force myself to do something that I wasn't really good at. I used to force myself uh, to stay at the cocktail party, exchanging business cards and you know, chit-chatting with people that I don't know. But then I realized it's not very efficient. So um, instead of playing by their rules, I went back. I created a different game that's at my own favor. So um, I think that, that, that became a turning point that I uh, started to strategize uh, everything I do and strategize um, my efforts my, and my time and trying to make things uh, more efficiently in my own way. Wow, Jill, that is such a great story. Isn't that a wonderful um, story? And it's so well, it is. It it seems to be, you know, really reflecting on the strengths that you bring to any given situation and making sure that you have a plan to bring those strengths to light in the best way instead of forcing yourself into someone else's um, idea of, of how you should be in the world. So there is a, a poll about this um, that we had prepared earlier, and I think this would be a good time to share it. Um, this is related to introverts' top career challenges. And you may feel that there are other career challenges that we haven't mentioned. Um, but Jill was bringing to light this idea of networking and how challenging that can be. So we'd love to know from you, which of these three challenges do you identify most with? Or you can select more than one. Um, is it difficult for you as an introvert? Or do you see it to be difficult for introverts to sell themselves, to deal with job interviews, or to be in networking situations? And thanks yeah, and for Becky, those of you who are already sharing your thoughts. Yeah, and Becky, let me just, I uh, just want to reinforce on Jill's story and, and to Jill, I think what she is also illustrating there is what we have found to be the ace in the hole for introverts. The top, one of the top differentiators, and by the way, that they have um, versus extroverts oftentimes, which is preparation. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen that time and time again in, in taking that, leveraging that skill the way Jill did. I mean, the results are incredible. But Jill, I had another favorite story from the book that I hope I can just throw in here quickly. I'll be real short. Um, and that was the story that when you told about when you were negotiating, Jill has chapters on different um, career challenges that we have. Both introverts and extroverts can learn from this. And you had a very senior level guy that was looking at you kind of like this. And you know, we couldn't, you couldn't read his face. You were in the live room with him. I think it was in the United States that that mm -hmm. occurred, yeah, right? Was. Yeah. And um, you couldn't read his signals at all. And then what did he say? He, he said to you, I wrote it down here. Um, the quiet ones, are, it was a tough negotiation, but you were quiet and all these people were talking really loud and you, I should tell, let you tell the story, but I just remember, and I remember the line, he said, the quiet ones are the most circumspect. <laughs> and could you just follow up with what happened with that story? Did you, did you have a successful outcome? Yeah, I remember that time I wasn't a manager yet. I was part of the team members. Mm -hmm. I, I was part of the team and the managers are, they, they were do, doing all the talking and um, uh, they were having very tough discussions with each other. And then one of the um, managers uh, turned to me and said, hey, I noticed Jill hasn't been talking. I think she has something to say. <laughs> So I was put on the spot and I, I, I've been listening carefully and I've been listening um, uh, strategically, so to say, and I've been strategizing uh, on my mind. So when I expressed my uh, ideas, they, they really liked the idea. And then we successful, successfully closed the deal. Let that wow. be a lesson to all of us who negotiate, the less you say, <laughs> the better. And also, Jill, I love that word listening strategically. Could you just say a word about what you mean by that? Because I, I think that's a great way to capture what introverts do. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I think 
yeah, introverts are super um, great at listening. And a lot of times we pay more attention to details. We read between the lines. We capture all those nitty gritty things that uh, doesn't sh express um, um, like obviously. But uh, I, I think it's one of uh, the talents of the introverts that we can easily capture all those. And from all the, sometimes those information are critical. So by capturing those and pi by paying attention and thinking strategically on how to deal with those actually can give us a lot of advantages um, in, a, in negotiations, in um, selling yourselves, in like making a sales in, in almost every um, occasions in, in the workplace. Well, let's take a quick look at these poll results. It looks like 70% of people think that the introvert's top career challenge is selling themselves. 23% uh, mentioned job interviews and 66% uh, mentioned networking. So thanks to those of you, there's some really wonderful conversation and collaboration going on in the chat and I love seeing that. Uh, we will get to some of the questions later. I would like to just respond to the selling themselves one because that is that is a big concern, and I know Jill, you feel this way too. And there's ways introverts can do it, but I want to bring in the organizational uh, view of that just for a moment. And if we think about if introverts are not, if we don't know what introverts are doing and what their contributions are, if people if they're not as visible as they can be, um, then it's not just a nice to have. I mean, this this really has incredibly negative results on organizations that are not capturing 40 to 60% of their talent. So I just want to bring that perspective in that introverts, and I want to hear Jill's view on that, was how, how introverts can sell themselves in an introvert friendly way. But I think as organization, as leaders, we need to extricate that. We need to not pass over people if they're quieter and, and get that, make it easy for them to, to share their accomplishments, to highlight them, to advocate. There's many strategic strategies we have in the book where effective leaders of introverts empower their people to shine. So I think it's on both sides, but Jill, could you give any quick tips since that was a pretty strong result on the poll? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So uh, about marketing ourselves, uh, again, introverts are not uh, great braggers. We don't. We just don't brag. <laughs> uh, and but I think uh, in the workplace, it's necessary for us to really market ourselves and um, uh, increase our visibility. And without bragging, there are actually ways to do that. For example, um, if we're not good at saying things in front of a group of people um, during meetings, we can actually uh, set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with our managers or with the uh, um, uh, decision makers to let them know that we are not just sitting in the meeting room and um, not think, my, not paying attention to anything. We were there thinking, we we're just not very comfortable like speaking in front of a, a large group of people. And also we can uh, utilize the ways that we are more comfortable with, for example, writing. Um, my suggestion for introverts is actually um, take, take meetings, for example, if we are not good at um, like making a long speech in the meetings, maybe we can send a proposal before or after the meeting or we can set up follow-up meetings with the manager, with the colleagues or with the decision makers um, to express ourselves and to make sure that we are heard and uh, we, are, um, we are staying in the game and um, they are considering us as still as part of the team instead of just uh, ignoring all the introverts. I love that. And I love the building of relationships too that comes out of that. So people get to know you. And that's, that's another exactly. strength that introverts have that you go deeper. Um, uh, with folks. So thank you for highlighting those, Becky. I just wanted to highlight that because it was it came out so strongly on the poll. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. So um, this question is for both of you, and we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some advice for introverts during COVID-19. In particular, what advice would you give companies and individuals about remote work and how to include introverts more effectively in this new remote work world? You want me Jill, to would you, I don't know. Yeah. I was going to ask Jill to speak first. Okay, please, please. 
<laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, remote working. I've been remote working for almost five years now, and my I work directly with uh, over 16 time zones, I guess. So my working hours are super long. And um, in addition to time management, I think introverts and pretty much everyone should be should pay more attention to our energy energy management. Um, take myself, for example, because my days are very long and I get instant messages all the time asking, do you have a quick moment to chat or can I just check in with you on something or something? And sometimes that's very draining and imagine doing like this for 16 hours a day and that's a lot. So um, what I would say for both uh, company and individuals are really pay attention to our energies. So to be more specific, to be more specific on a company level, I um, I think the, one of the most important um, element of this is really to streamline communication. So for example, creating an international uh, internal wiki is a super helpful way to minimize the cost of communication because we realize people, um, we chase the others all the time or we wait for others feedback or we are being chased or we're being uh, waited. And, and that's very costly for uh, companies. So from what I see if we have an internal wiki, uh, which includes all the guidelines, all the manuals, all the FAQs, so that people don't need to ask around for quick answers, that will actually save a lot of um, time and, and energy and energy for the team members. And also I think for company, it's a great time to start to think maybe creating a more remote working friendly culture of um, doing things. For example, like what I said, when people ask me, hey, do you have five minutes to chat? To chat, I don't know what to do and I don't know what to prepare, right? So instead of saying that, maybe we can start training or educating uh, team members to ask more specific questions, such as within the next three hours, do you have 15 minutes for a project? I have this challenge and I have three potential solutions, but I need your thoughts. You know, things like that will really benefit how companies um, um, minimize the cost of communication. And on a personal level, I think, again, again it's all about energy. Um, especially for introverts, I think setting a boundary for ourselves are very important. Um, take myself, for example, because my working hours are very long, I tend to schedule meetings in early mornings and then uh, in late evenings and in late nights. So in that way, during the day, I can have my own period of time uh, working on my own projects and tasks without being disturbed. Uh, people ask me all the time, uh, uh, saying like, what about the urgent requests from your team members or from uh, people you're managing who need your um immediate response. I always say that, and I'm still learning, but uh, I think instead of uh, meeting all those uh, pressing requirements or pressing questions, what introverts need to learn is that we need to prioritize the important things uh, over the urgent things. I, I found sometimes it, there's a very fine line between this. And sometimes I know we, we all tend to chase all those urgent deadlines. But um, I think remote working is a really great chance for us to take a step back and really strategize how we need to uh, put our energies and efforts um, on our techs and really take full control of our time and um, our efforts. Um, and that, that's reflected uh, on our calendars. Thank you, Jill. Jennifer, do you want to respond? What I ideas another, do you have I to add? Another, I'm sorry, I just hear another book there, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> That's your next book. Let's ask the audience if they agree. You have deep knowledge in this, right? A deep knowledge. I really don't have a lot to add at all to, uh, which is, as Becky knows, unusual. <laughs> But I will, I want to bring the other side into it. Um, and it's not op an option in all cases uh, 
for remote work. But one of the, I'm tracking what's happening now. And uh, many people say to me, well, isn't it nirvana? Isn't it just the ideal paradise for introverts? And I would have to say there's a lot of pros from what Jill is confirming here in terms of being able to focus, in terms of having autonomy over connection with people. And one of the biggest challenges we had pre-COVID on the survey, the thing that people had the most angst about, Becky, do you, can you guess what that was when they were in the open office? Oh, I think about getting interrupted when they're trying to do their work bingo. and their deep work. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Mm. It was interruptions, 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 which extroverts don't, they also get concerned, but they don't seem to be as bothered by it. So that is one of the things that we're seeing in remote work is a truly, is a true gift. And Jill would probably agree with that. Now let's look at just on the other side, as companies are planning to move back in, many are looking at some sort of a hybrid model. I think what we're missing now is the, um, is the extemporaneous collaboration uh, that happens when you walk by somebody's area that they're sitting, you hear what they're working on, it puts context to your work, you're able to then say, I can contribute this. We're missing that. Yes, yeah, some of it's happening on some of our programs like Slack and others, uh, but it, we, we do miss that as well as the socialization. Many people are reporting now that their friends are at work and they're lonely. And introverts can, one of the, the things I found in research on quiet influence is that any uh, overuse of a strength becomes a weakness. And so if we are in our heads too much, uh, if we're, there's taking too much quiet time, we can, as some of us have even experienced, get depressed, get lonely, get sad, and that can be exacerbated if we're not around people running into them at the, at the coffee lounge. So there's not, I don't think there's a perfect solution, but I love the tips that Jill gave, particularly around communication. So I guess yeah. I have more to say as an extrovert thinks aloud, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you extroverts can, can agree with that, right? Thank you. But it's a great question, Becky. Thanks. Sure. And I did notice, Jill, in the chat that someone was asking for an example of what a good internal wiki might look like. And so potentially that's something that we can answer in our follow-up email to provide an example of that. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm super grateful uh, leading a remote team to have Basecamp as a software where we have a lot of those, you know, ideas and FAQs and uh, messages captured and a way of communicating asynchronously. So um, we have so many questions. I yes. ask, oh, okay. Then I, I know we have a lot of questions, but something just came up yesterday in a webinar was on. I want to know what the audience thinks and what you think about. We can turn cameras off. Jill, I don't know. Is that something you think that introverts can use? Because people don't feel like they have the permission to do that. It's something we need to talk about with our teams that we don't always have to have our cameras on because it's exhausting. And we're trying to read people's faces like right now. What do you think, Jill? It is. I, I think we can set up, actually set up a guideline uh, for the team members to follow. For example, for all staff uh, stand up meetings for that 30 minutes or an hour, we can always turn the camera on. But if it's one on one chat, if it's just a quick chat, actually uh, turning the camera off, it's really beneficial for introverts because that saves a lot of our energies. Thank you. I'm quoting you on that to my next client. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm going to throw the book up here too. Oh, I'd love to see it. I'll throw yours up, Jennifer. Let's give love to both the books. Um, so it's it's really difficult. We have uh, time to get to some of these questions. Um, I love this one. How can extroverts be more supportive of introverted team members? And we shared a few of those ideas already, but what additional ideas are there for how extroverts can be more supportive of introverted team members? Um, well, Jill, Jennifer, do you want to go? <laughs> what would you like to see? Bill? I, do that. I can tell you what we can yeah. do, but what would you like to see us do other than two words, shut up? <laughs> but you would never say that because you're so polite. But um, my husband, Bill, as some of you know, I make fun of him all the time, merciless, mercilessly. Um, he will sometimes come in and say, read the book. <laughs> when I'm chatting. <laughs> but Jill, what about, what do you think extroverts can do? And then I'll share some thoughts. Yeah, actually, I wanted to share um, my story with one of my favorite managers. He, he was my previous manager, and he was in ambivert. That's what he said, but I thought he was an extreme extrovert because he's so different from me. And we work together very well because he always listens to me. And uh, what he really does, he's, he gave his, all his support to me. And whatever... Um, 
for example, when there's a networking event, he would always ask me about whether I'm comfortable, comfortable going or not. And if that's the occasion I need to go, he would say, okay, you can leave early. And if you're not comfortable leaving early alone, I can walk you out the door and then I'll come back. So such respect and freedom really, really means a lot to me because uh, having such support, uh, it's really helpful for, uh, for me to get my job done and for me to increase my job satisfactions and um, really about every aspect of work. Um, so he's actually one of the managers. He's the, the, the manager that I think who's making the best use of me of all time. So yeah, I, I, after working with him, I'm like, yeah, I want to be that kind of manager when I'm working with different type of person. I would always listen to them and always give them the best support I can give. <laughs> That's wonderful because so many uh, people talk about their best leaders being and managers that they could ever remember being an introvert. So I'm glad that some mm. of us made the cut. <laughs> <Jill>. <laughs> to use your Jill's been in sports and baseball, so she knows. But I just want to read out a couple of quick tips here from the book about anyone can be a change agent. And what I observed with effective people was one, their voices for the quiet. Uh, they speak up when they see that an introvert hasn't been heard from, let's say at a meeting or a, a program is designed so that there's no opportunity to sit back and write and reflect. So when we have a consciousness about this aspect of, and I, believe it's an aspect of diversity, then we're just aware of inequity. And so that's what I'd like people to be, to be a voice for the quiet and intentionally address introvert needs in our planning. Like in this program, you know, we have the use of a chat that's, that's introvert friendly, right? So the people can be, I see, I think the people are talking to each other and that's a, a great way to get engagement as an example. Um, involving introverts in our research when we're making plans. And I would say one of the key, there's others in the book, but one that I, I, I'm very, uh, I love the work of Edgar Schein, who's also happens to be a Bear Kohler author and organizational psychologist. And what I have seen in really addressing this issue is, and others related to cultural change, is that we need to get senior leadership on board if we're going to move the needle. And Edgar Schein said, it's what leaders do, what they do, what they pay attention to, and what they encourage and reward that will ultimately change the organization's culture. And that's where we need to, we need to head. We need to make our leaders aware of this situation and it's happening of introversion and extroversion and that it's another element, as I say, of diversity. So I'm very encouraged about that. So on the topic of diversity, we had a question that came in earlier, Jennifer, and I would love it if you and Jill could speak to this one. Um, someone mentioned that their company is focusing on diversity, equality, and inclusion. And how can this leader prepare to bring up introverts and introversion when asking for input for the committee? Oh, okay. You mean in terms of it bring this as a topic? It, it, there is still some stigma around it. It's interesting, Becky, and I'm not sure if that was the, what the person was referring to, but they can take, um, talk about their own journey and learning about this and you know, share information about the books uh, that they've been reading and just say it's an element that we want to take a look at. I was on a, a global inclusion summit the other day with a Fortune 50 company, and they are... Um, to be applauded because they're looking at many elements of diversity and that's maybe how that person can position it. Say there are, there are many elements that are below the iceberg as, as is termed, where we don't necessarily see if somebody has a learning disability or somebody's temperament, but we really need to factor all of these things in when we're discussing our team and getting to know each other. So that may be, those are maybe some tips for that person, but I appreciate that question. Jill, anything to add? Not much. I think Jennifer pretty much covers it all. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so th this listener is wondering if you can share your insights for a team led by introverts and all or almost all the team members are also introverts. Any different way of leading in that situation? Jill, you want to take that one? Um, As an introverted and, team leader, and you have a real challenge around the world. So <laughs> what, what strengths do you bring into play there, do you think, in, in terms of leading your team? Yeah, I, I think as an introvert leader, I tend to pay a lot of attention of what people say. 
um, sometimes it's not verbal. Sometimes it's how they work or how they express things or what wasn't said. So um, if you have a, you, you, if you happen to be an introvert leader, in introvert manager, uh, and uh, you're managing a, a team of introverts, I think the good thing is that you guys know each other very well. You wouldn't push your leaders to go beyond their boundaries. You wouldn't uh, be too harsh on them and to encourage them to talk too much. But at the same time, I think it is important for us to uh, step out of our comfort zones. And as a manager, it's, it's critical because you're leading the team and your team members rely on you uh, to do their career growth, to develop their um, capacities and to really grow into a different level. So as a manager, I, I, I think um, you can actually step into their shoes and see what their needs are and what can be helpful for their career um, overall. Sometimes it's not very comfortable and sometimes it's not even be appreciated, but that's the step um, I think managers need to take. And uh, I'm not saying that you need to push people outside of their comfort zone in huge steps. What I do is that I would encourage introverts to take baby steps out of their comfort zones once at a time. And in, in that pace, that's the pace that introverts are more comfortable with. And with that, I believe the team will grow together and you will grow as a manager as well as the team members will grow in their own positions as well. And I love that Jill is saying that because what we found in, in research with introverted leaders who are successful like Jill is that they do take those four steps. We call them the four Ps. They prepare they're present in the moment and they push that she was mentioning. And then they continue to practice and refine those skills, whether it be, and you talk about this in the book, Jill, public speaking, whether it be networking and they get better at those, they still are true to themselves and don't, like you say, get so far out of their comfort zone that it's, it's just excruciating the way it was for you before you know you had this awareness but i think we should say that introverts and extroverts we all need to develop and grow we can't just stay in our comfort zone all of the time and if we do that we get better at those skills it's like a muscle that we just keep strengthening yes. and a lot of introverted leaders jill i don't know if anyone said this to you yet but they go well you're not an introvert now, they may not have said <laughs> that but they go no and they argue with people they say you're not an introvert they say you have no idea i'm a very strong introvert many of them will say that but because they've they've developed and enhanced and had practice with all of these leadership skills nobody knows so they, mm -hmm. they get questions it's kind of funny sometimes have you have you heard that or seen it yeah yeah i've heard that a lot myself too but i think that's the case for extra extroverted leaders too because we all need to learn to be uh, like as an extrovert you need to be introverted you need to pay attention to what people say sometimes right and as an, an introvert you need to stand up and speak up sometimes so all of us are learning and all of us are expanding our horizons and you know stepping out of in, you know expanding our comfort zones that's what I agree. I, I agree. And I think extroverts have not been really honestly been very interested in that because they didn't really feel the pain. But I'll say back to Becky's question about COVID, I'm hearing from a lot of extroverts that they're actually enjoying having not being addicted to busyness and having getting in touch with the quiet. So I think mm -hmm. that's another positive example of uh, or outcome of this uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, I had several questions of people asking you to re uh, repeat those four P's. It's prepare. Prepare. Present. Present. So prepare is you're not worrying about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the past or the obsessing about the future. You you do your excellent preparation like Jill was talking about. The second one is presence. So when you're in that challenge, you're in the moment, you are able to switch and flex. So when I throw Jill a question, she hasn't seen yet she's able to because she's here and with me she's able to answer so presence is really being engaged and introverted leaders do that so well the third one is a uh, push as jill was talking about stretching not so far that it's going to be excruciating but you're going to keep pushing yourself every day to learn you know be a little uncomfortable and then the fourth is practice 
it's continuing to refine your skills. And that's what the great virtuosos, great athletes do. They never settle, they always refine. So that's all laid out in the second edition of the Introverted Leader, which yeah. came out last year with lots of examples. And, and Jill was very supportive of that as well. So as we end the hour, I'm gonna to come to an elephant in the chat or an elephant in the room. There are several people who have made a few comments that we, we are talking about this idea of introverts and extroverts, and there seems to be some bias, whether conscious or unconscious, and the indication that introversion is a problem. Um, and I, I have had, there's some comments that, um, Michael said, introversion has a negative connotation and the stereotype needs to be changed. Is this correct? So I'm wondering, um, as the final question, if you could comment on this idea that's been threaded through the chat about, you know, are we actually, you know, talking negatively about introverts or, you know, what are we really saying here? Jill, you want to take that one and I'll follow yeah. up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I think um, things are changing right now. When I grew up, introversion is a negative word. Like you're too quiet, you're too introverted. I heard that all the time when I grew up. But now I, um, as um, a lot of people working on this topic, including Jennifer started working on this 10 years ago, which is amazing. Um, you guys are changing the world. And uh, as of today, I can confidently say that I'm an introvert without worrying people would put stigma on me and they wouldn't have negative stereotypes. So I, I think people are getting a better understanding of how those different types of people work. It's not that either type is better or either type is worse. It's just uh, the way we work is different. So that's my take on how we define introverts and how we see uh, introverted people. But back to uh, the question, I think in the, in the workplace, there's still a long way for us to go because like what Jennifer said, we still need to be more inclusive for people of all kinds. We still need to um, design the process to be more introvert friendly or more everyone friendly. Um, so yeah, I, I, but I think that's, um, we're, we're having a great start of the whole movement. We're, we're uh, making progress and we're moving forward and we're pushing it forward. So I, I, I strongly think, and I believe that um, in the future, we will have a more uh, equal workplace uh, where, where introverts and extroverts can work um, closely together and more seamlessly. Thank you so much for those powerful words. Jennifer, I think you have like 60 seconds. No, I, I have nothing to add to that beautiful summary. I, I'm actually getting a little teary eyed here because I'm reflecting back on in 2007 when I started to write this book. And since that time, Jill's talking, Jill is a leader and we have people in the Netherlands, we have people all over the world who are writing and speaking out and the companies are asking us to talk about it. So I, I see a revolution, introverts rock. I mean, it's very heartwarming to me. I'm getting a little emotional here, but that's okay too. That's okay too. Um, so I want to thank, I want to thank Bear Kohler for bringing this book to sp sponsoring this webinar and bringing this book um, to so many English speaking audiences who will now have the benefit of learning about, about, how an introvert can be so successful and uh, and go through the struggles and the triumphs. So um, thank you to BK. Thank you, Weaving Influence, for doing a fabulous job. And most of all, thank you to my friend and colleague, Jill Chang. So uh, we do have a slide that shows some next steps and calls to action if you're interested in learning more from these authors, Kelly. And uh, so we are putting in the chat some links to buy Jill's book. It's available on Amazon. I did have some questions about the audiobook. Kristen, if you're still here, if you can comment on whether or not there's an audiobook available or when that's coming. You can also visit Jill's website to download an excerpt from the book, or you can join the Introvert Cafe LinkedIn group as a chance of collaborating with others who maybe introverts. Um, and a few next steps with Jennifer. Um, 
you can buy one of her four books or buy them all. They're all available on Amazon and other online retailers. You can also free, uh, view Jennifer's free book discussion guide, which is based on the latest book, Creating Introvert Friendly Workplaces. You can take a quiz to find out how introvert friendly your organization is. And you can also visit Jennifer's website at jenniferconweiler.com. So all of these links, as well as a link to the recording will be available in your email very soon. You can always find all of the Weaving Influence archived webinars on our YouTube channel. We have more than 100 archived webinars that we would welcome you to take, uh, take a look at and enjoy. And thank you so much for your investment of time with us today. Ladies, I'm going to let you have the final word. And I think, Jennifer, that you wanted to toast Jill. Um, it is evening in Taiwan. Jill yes. does have a celebratory beverage on the day of her book launch. Yes. Um, I'm going to raise my coffee cup. I just splashed it. <laughs> and uh, it's too and, and raise a glass to uh to jill and a great triumph so thank you thank jill. you yeah. thank you jennifer thank you becky thank you everyone here's to the introvert revolution yay